Good morning to everyone present over here. First of all, I would like to thank each one of you for joining this webinar today. I feel great proud to say that this exceptionally different talk has been organized by our Department of Statistics and Department of Computer Science in collaboration with Missimble AI, a Swedish India startup in Nagpur, on statistics, the core of machine learning. I feel privileged to share that such talks have been brought up for our students to enlighten our young minds and promote the participation of students at all levels and to understand the life with statistics. I bide a warm welcome to our renowned speakers, Ms. Madhumita Roy Ma'am, Mr. Mayur Mahurkar Sir, his team from Nassimble AI, Dr. Mamta Bahiti Ma'am and Dr. Ruta, Rupa Ma'am, who took out their valuable time and joined us today to be a part of this invited talk. We are honored to have you with us. I would like to request our head of statistics department, Dr. Jyoti Shivalkar Ma'am, to please take up the platform and share her words with us. Uh, good morning, all of you. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Mamta Baheti, and today's uh, guest speakers, Madhumita Roy and Mayur Mahurkar. Uh, and my dear students, I want to share with you that uh, today it is actually a peer session. Why? because both the speakers, they are MSc Statistics and Madhumita is my student. She graduated from Islop College during 2012 to 2015, very bright student. And she graduated with Economic Statistics and Mathematics. And I'm very happy that today she is with us and she is from, uh, sharing her views from California. Okay, and to meet her time, we are starting the program at 10 o'clock. Dear students, I want to share with you that uh, we have observed that there is a sudden uh, increase in the demand of uh, for data science and machine learning. And these students, Mayur came uh, one day, Mayur met me and he said that, Madam, our students are not aware that what topics are important and what topics in the graduation level are important in this machine learning. So. I want to orient them. So the objective of this particular workshop is to orient you about machine learning, artificial intelligence and data science and what type of uh, topics are needed there and what type of softwares you need to um, uh, you need to uh, learn. So this webinar is important for of course statistics students and as well as computer science students because Artificial intelligence, intelligence is a field of say computer science and machine learning, core of machine learning, it has a natural synergy with statistics. So here I welcome all the students from computer science and statistics group and I'm happy that uh, I think how many more uh, 84 students are there, but I was expecting at least 150 students. So those who are missing this seminar may be, may not be, knowing about it, uh, this uh, core, uh, uh, this particular uh, topic that is machine learning. But I feel that those who attend this program will be oriented about the course of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Ensemble AI, I thank the Ensemble AI company, which is a Swedish India, a, a Swedish India startup company based in Nagpur to I congratulate them and I thank them for initiating coming to Hislop College and then organizing such a collaborative program with the Department of Statistics and Computer Science. With these words, I wish all the best for all the students for setting their career and goal in the field of machine learning, data science and artificial, artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for your kind words. I would also like to request our head of computer science department, Dr. Mamta Bahiti Ma'am, to guide us with her words. Good and uh, my colleague and young This is an opportunity in COVID-19 pandemic that 
virtually many things can be uh, visualized and taken into action. To do this, we have our resource person from California, from Nagpur, and the various different locations within. Students, it is a very good opportunity for you because due to the COVID-19 pandemic, huge bulk of data is available across both to excessive use of internet and to make strategies and policies for government organizations or any of the organizations. They need to analyze the data. Analyze the data. Your whole strategy are implemented. But come up with certain predictions need to have machine learning algorithm. So this is a very good opportunity for each one of you to find the combination and interrelation between statistics and machine learning and create your bright future in the field of data science. Now, as per current research trends, it has been found that none of the stream of science can have their individual existence. So this is very good opportunity for each one of you to have collaborated work and come up with a solution for real time data and work on real time data. So I extend my own uh, thanks to Mayur and Madhunita for uh, extending their guidance to our students, and this will really bridge up the gap between industry and academics. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for your guiding light. Now, taking forward this webinar, let's get introduced to our guest for this starting beautiful morning. Ms. Madhumita Roy, ma'am, she is a data analyst at an RPM healthcare company called Harmonize in Silicon Valley, California. She graduated with a master's in statistics from San Jose State University, California. Before moving to the Bay Area, Mam completed her BA in statistics, mathematics, and economics from Hislop College, Nagpur, and master's in statistics from Institute of Science, Nagpur. Mam is passionate about using statistics as a tool to provide data-driven strategies from business development and growth. Ma'am was the president and co-founder of the first SJSU Data Science Club, where she mentored the members for data analysts, professional networking, and communication. Madhumita Ma'am lives by the philosophy that one must dream big because that's where it all starts. The strength and support from her family, friends, and professors have played a key role in her journey from Nagpur to Silicon Valley. I would like to request ma'am to please take up the platform and enlighten us with her knowledge and share us her journey from statistics students to a data science professional. Ah, thank you so much. That was a really good introduction. So for, uh, first of all, can you guys hear me good? Okay, let me know if you can't hear me. Um, yes, ma'am, so you're audible. Oh, great, thank you. Um, so let me, I, I've prepared a few slides because I feel like if you're in person, it's easy to engage and talk to everybody. But uh, since I, we are all online here, so I made a few slides to just go through everything I have to share today. So I'll share my screen. Okay. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Awesome. Cool. Um, so yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I just want to say I am so excited to be here today. I almost feel like I'm a part of college again. 
And when um, the co-founders of Ensemble AI reached out to me and one of them, uh, both of them are my friends, I was so, so excited because not so long ago, I think six years ago, I was one of you guys. So today I really want to use this opportunity to share my journey with you, to not just inspire you uh, that you can pursue whatever you want, you can achieve your dreams, but also to give you some really helpful and useful tips that I personally used um, to accelerate my career in the field of data. So on a high level, uh, I'm going to start with talking about my journey from Hislop College uh, to being a data analyst uh, as I am today. And then the second half of my talk uh, is going to be about all the lessons that I've learned, the mistakes that I've made, and, and the suggestions that I have for you guys to become hireable in, in the data world. Um, OK, so let me start with my journey. So I, I took the liberty to add some pictures just to keep this presentation a little bit interesting. So bear with me. Um, so where did this all start for me? Where? Well, this started exactly where you all are today from Hislop College. So I joined Hislop College initially with the focus being on economics. So I was very sure, right? Like I was sure I want to do economics and that's going to be my career. But very soon after I joined Hislop, my interest started leaning towards statistics and I actually started pursuing statistics as the field. And the credit for that actually goes to the department. And this happened because the way the curriculum and the classes are organized in Hislop College by uh, uh, Hislop College Stats Department by Shivalkar Ma'am and Magdan Joglaker Ma'am, um, it really spiked my interest in the subject. And I really saw how useful it was to have this as a, as a tool uh, in the industry. So essentially, thanks to Hislop College, uh, you, that's where uh, this all started, and that, that's the place where I fell in love with statistics. So about in my like second and third year, I had to decide, like, what do I want to do next, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to graduate with a BA in economics, maths, and stats. Where do, where do I want to go next? So I got swayed away for a little bit. I, I uh, prepared for MBA entrance exam in which I did not perform well, and <laughs> so which was a good thing because... Uh, when that happened, I had to decide again, okay, what should I do? And I went back to what I really initially loved, which is statistics. That was the point when I decided, all right, I want to do master's in statistics, but I want to do it from the United States. And why I chose that, I'll get to that in just a second. So one thing you need to know about um, getting a master's from US is that they need you to have four years of bachelors but since i was like ba and even bsc we only get three years of of our undergrad right so to compensate for those four years i decided to join uh, institute of science and just like finish msc in statistics and then come to us and during that time there um, i received full support from the department there as well that helped me keep the balance between the msc and and my preparation for coming over to us so let me talk a little bit about like why I decided to, uh, why I was confident that I wanted to do a master's in statistics here. So first, and the very obvious reason is that data field is booming all over the world, right? And statistics is essentially the science behind handling data. So I was very sure like this is the subject that if I, if I do this subject as my master's, I'll definitely get a kickstart in my career, um, especially in the field of data. And of course, the second reason was I wanted to go abroad to just get like a more vast career opportunities to meet new people and just like experience culture. So exposure was definitely one of the other reasons. Um, so yeah, I put up this picture uh, of my parents here. So they were dropping me off. This was the last day in India and they were dropping me off at the Delhi International Airport and I was flying to San Francisco. It was a very emotional and exciting moment for me and my family. Um, however, I have to say, you know, it was not super easy. There were a lot of ups and downs on the road, um, a lot of figuring out to do because pursuing a degree in US is a very expensive matter. And so I could only find two colleges where I could afford to apply. And one of them, and I got into both of them, um, and one of them turned out to be 
San Jose State University. So luckily, I very, very lucky, I got into San Jose State University and I started doing uh, my master's in statistics in January 2018. And um, my experience here was full of learning, beautiful struggles, and just meeting amazing people. So first of all, I have to say, when I joined, I was very nervous um, because it was a foreign country and I didn't know how the education system works here exactly. But, which is when everything that I learned in India, my, all the stats education I got from back in India was very, very helpful. And that's because most of the core subjects, like regression, for example, all those core subjects were exactly the same here. So I was glad that I had a good foundation to start an MSc in statistics here. And for those of you who don't know, this is like a little bit of highlight of, of uh, just a high level highlight of what I went through in the two years. Um, so Silicon Valley, California is actually one of the most expensive places in the world, which is not a very good thing because it's uh, it gets really difficult to afford even rent. So I, I managed college and I worked at cafeteria and as a teaching assistant to make my own money and, and to be able to afford my living expenses here. So yeah, like um, you like it was mentioned during my introduction, I, we also co-founded my friends and I. So the this picture right there is like all, all my friends and I, we together co-founded the first data science club at San Jose State. So in December 2019, I graduated uh, on time, which was good. And soon after that, I think a month after that, I got a job as a data analyst at a healthcare startup called Harmonize. So I'm working there even today. So let me give like a brief introduction of what my company does so you have some idea. So what does RPM mean? So RPM is remote patient monitoring, which means what my company does is that we, our patients have Harmonize app in their phones and they take their measurements. So it can be their weight, their blood sugar, their blood uh, or their blood pressure. And they submit that data through the app in the phone to us. And if say the patient has really high BP or they have really high blood sugar, that alerts in our system. And when that happens, we call the patients and we try to connect them to their doctors and they help them out. So basically we are trying to take care of patients in their own homes and in their own comfortable conditions. So that's like a very high level of what Harmonize does. Um, so the next thing is like, what's my job here? What do I do? So, and how am I applying statistics here, right? Like that's important. So essentially at my job, what I'm using statistics for is defining metrics that help us understand whether our business is growing and going in the good direction or not. And for that, I build dashboards. So here's a little example of what the dashboard looks like. Uh, it's it's an image from Google. I, I could not really use the dashboard image of my company because of confidentiality. But yeah, essentially, this is like a good example of the kind of dashboards I build. And then I also do various ad hoc analysis for different departments in my company. So one of them is the operations department, then the product department, the, that is the one that handles the application, and also just like overall working with the CEO and the co-founders to track the growth and the wellness of the company. Besides this, I also use statistics um, for analyzing whether a feature is effective or not. So I think you all, I mean, I think most people here would know about T-tests. So we also call it as A-B test. So I actually use that in my job on a daily basis to analyze effectiveness of different products. So the tools that I use on pretty much everyday basis is SQL. So SQL is essentially used for um, just uh, extracting data from the data infrastructure. So the big sets of data we have, I use SQL to ext extract data from there. And then Python and Looker. So Python is used for heavy analysis and um, data modeling, data prediction. And whereas Looker is used for dashboarding tool, which is like an example, which is shown on the, on the right-hand corner of the screen. So yeah, so this is like my journey so far. Um, this is what I'm doing right now. And I'm and I'm, I'm excited to see what comes up next in my life. 
But the next thing that I wanted to share with you all is that what have I learned all this time, right? Like all these things that I went through, what useful insights can I provide to you guys? So that's the whole point of my talk today. Um, all right. Oops. I think my screen is stuck. There you go. Okay. So what are my lessons and suggestions? So as a starting point, um, I think we all know this and we all would agree with this, that data is the present and the future. So just like if you guys remember in early 2000, ID industry was booming. Like that was the, that was the hot area where everybody was trying to make their career in. But today is data science, machine learning or artificial intelligence is the big thing, which means you guys are off to a great start by the way. And as I think uh, our professors described, data science is essentially statistics, which is the heart of this field, and it helps you understand how you should approach data. Then the second is coding. So why do we need that? Well, it's because the data is, we have large amount of data. We cannot possibly do it manually, which is where coding um, using Python and R comes in. And then last but very important part of the equation is that you should be really passionate about solving problem using this data. So for me, like this, these are the core parts are of the data science equation. And like I said, um, you guys are at a great spot, right? Um, in order to be hireable in this field, at least in my experience in the Silicon Valley, I, I can tell you from my perspective that the good news is if you are a stats or a computer science major, you're already very hireable. Right. However, here's the mistake that I was almost going to commit when I came here. I thought, all right, I have, I'm going to go to US. I'm going to do my master's in statistics. I'll be a good student and I'll get a job. That's not enough. That is not enough. You just have to go that one extra mile in order to be really industry ready. So even though having a college degree is very important and it will attract a lot of job recruiters, but they also want to see in your resume that you truly are passionate and you have the skills for the industry and the field, right? So here are some top uh, high level items I think you should have on your resume and you should have experience using these, uh, using these skills. So one is of course R and I believe like uh, people are already using R in the department. Then there's Python, of course. I think Python is one of the most popular uh, data science tool. And lastly, SQL, uh, which is also a very important skill to have. On another thing I think uh, your resume should have is just some side projects. So projects that are not specifically a part of school and your college, just something you want to do, right? There are so many free uh, data sets available on the internet and on GitHub. So you can go and start working on those projects, put that on your resume and your job recruiters will absolutely love it. The other thing that I think is really, really important um, as, a, as a data analyst or data scientist is how you communicate all the analysis and data findings you do. So imagine communicating all the technical uh, findings that you, that you got to a person who doesn't have the understanding of statistics. So here your communication skill, practicing your communication skill becomes very, very important to be a really hireable person. So lastly, um, what suggestions do I have for you guys? Like how can you achieve something like this, right? Um, so here's what I did as well. And I realized, uh, I thought I, it would be great if I can share with you guys is it's um sorry you guys able to hear me yes ma'am oh okay okay good yes so um what suggestions do i have for you guys to actually build that profile that will get you hired in the industry so first is having those skills that i mentioned in the previous slide so it's not that easy. You got, it's not that easy to even feel motivated to you know, do all those things by yourself. So perhaps one idea that I could think of was just create your own learning community, perhaps your own data science club where you can do group projects, where you are collaborating with students from different departments, like computer science is a great example. 
I mean, in that way, you can really learn from each other. So perhaps a STAT student can teach a computer science student some knowledge from stats and like you can share knowledge from each other and work on projects together in that way like imagine group projects with like experts from computer science field and stats field you can actually put that on your resume and that will really enhance your value the other thing which i think is uh, not very highly spoken about but this actually literally got me my job uh, was networking and making connections in the industry so this will at least increase your chances of getting an interview. So when you go out on LinkedIn, so I don't know how many of you have LinkedIn profile. If you don't go and make one today, like it doesn't matter if you have a lot to put it or not, you should have a LinkedIn profile, just like you all have a Facebook or an Instagram account, you must have it. So go and create a LinkedIn profile and just search for people in the field of data and send them connection requests. And that way you will have like this network of people who are already in the field. So if in the future, when you're looking for a job, you can reach out to them and ask them to see if they have any job openings at their comp in, in their company. So that way you will be exposed to like bigger opportunities than just applying online to the jobs. The other thing that I personally did um, when I was getting a job and I was trying to um, get an internship even, I was attending many, many conferences of, that was about data. So some of them were in person uh, and it was much easier when it was in person, but some of them were online and for free. So that is another thing I really want to recommend you guys to just go out there, search for data science conferences on Google and just see what you can attend and, and if you can make any connections from out there. And last but not the least, um, meet people from the industry. So of course, the way to do that is not just through LinkedIn and conferences, but even webinars like this, right? We already have two people from the industry here right now, which is Omkar and Mayur. They are already in, the, in, the, in this field with a great startup. So I would highly recommend you guys get in touch with them. And they are the experts in the field and they are here. So it's very likely that they will uh, try to help you out and guide you throughout uh, your journey of getting a job in the data world. Um, and so the next thing is get an internship. Here's a fun fact. I did two internships in my lifetime. Both of them were unpaid and I was sad about that. But you know what? It doesn't matter because I had those two internship in my resume. I was more likely to get a full time big job that I have right now because it shows that you are a person who is willing to learn irrespective of uh, whether you're getting paid or not. An internship is in, in general is a more of a learning experience, right? So I highly recommend getting out there and just go to go to people who you know from data and tell them, hey, I want to learn and I'm willing to do this even if it's for free and get some real industry experience that way. Put that on your resume and you will really, really bounce it up. Like industries, your recruiters will actually, you, you'll absolutely be able to capture recruiter attention. Um, last, uh, well, second last thing is mentorship. This is so, so key in order to have a great career in general. So what does mentorship mean? So just like the webinar today, today's webinar is actually kind of like a mentorship where you are hearing uh, guidance, you're getting guidance from people who are actually in the industry. So I really recommend like uh, talking to alumni like myself and other experts from the field like Omkar Mayur and even your professors to just brainstorm with them about your career and what you want to do next and see what advice they have for you. It really, really, really helps. Okay, um, last but not the least, this, will, this has to be there irrespective of where you go in life is please, please, please believe in yourself. I think you all are already at a place where People are really trying to help you. They're organizing these webinars. So you have all these amazing opportunities and information coming at you. And on top of that, just have that confidence that you will be able to get a job and you'll be able to crack it and do it. And I'm sure that will happen. Yeah, so uh, I don't know how much time I took when I talked for a while, but that's all I had for today. Uh, I hope this was helpful in case you have any more questions 
or if you if you have any anything else you want to ask me you can reach out to me on linkedin and i think we have a q and a at the end anyway so you can ask me that as well so that's it from me thank you thank you ma'am that was really a mesmerizing journey uh, i request everyone if there's any question for madhumita ma'am please ask you can ask in the chat box or else you can raise your hand and we announce your name and then you can ask anyone i'm actually i had one question if oh I yeah can. uh mom yes. actually uh, i wanted to know like as you said that there is a three year uh, like three year degree we are doing as a bachelor here in india mm -hmm. and four a uh, four year degree is needed when we go abroad so how was this change like you applied for masters and uh, were you uh, like applicable for it how were you uh, like did they allowed you for after three year degree or was it after you did your masters and then it was counted as five year degree and then you got applicable over there that's a really really good question um actually i applied in my almost during my second year of msc so basically when i completed first year of msc i had four years in my pocket so technically you do become eligible to apply and one of my friends actually uh, did not complete his msc and directly came to us after he completed his first year so that's very much possible so you don't need to have the full msc to to come here but i know some colleges can have different criteria so so i would definitely recommend checking with the college for first okay. but that was a great question thank you ma'am uh, akshar bhaiya has some question please okay there is one question in the uh, chat box yeah. ma'am uh Okay. I'll take okay. the question from the chat box first. I'll take the question. Okay, ma'am, how much of your programming was self-learned? Oh wow, that is a good one. Um, well, I would say about the useful programming for the industry, I would say at least sixty, sixty to seventy percent. Yeah, I, I, we were using a lot of programming um, during my masters here, but. programming is a really vast field right so a lot of it i had to learn just by myself which is why my friends and i started that club cuz we realized that oh so many students are in the same place as me and they want to learn so why don't we all just learn together so we did like a good 60% of programming learning by ourselves good question okay akshar bhaiya i've got uh, a two part question so what was your gre preparation journey and uh, getting into san jose was like and uh, did you face any challenges understanding the concept because of the differences between the indian education system and the us education system like in the teaching part and the second question like uh, i was what were you supposed to do in your internships and when did you do them and i i think you are not supposed to get coffee so <laughs> what was you what are you going to do that is uh, both really really great question so the first one was uh, my g about my gre preparations right and like whether i faced challenges uh, studying here so let me start with the gre preparation i joined i think i joined icad which is in dharampet um to prepare for gre so that's where i did my gre preparation i definitely didn't do it by myself um and the second question was whether i faced any challenges here oh yeah i did i definitely did i was really nervous when i came here cuz this was like the first time i was suddenly like exposed to this world which was so different um sometimes i would have problem understanding accents of of my teachers here uh but in terms of the education system i think um one the way most of most of the classes here work it's like it's 20% lectures and 80% it's assignment projects and and tests so and those assignments and projects are absolutely crazy so um just a small small example actually i can give is that this one time one of our professors and she is one of my favorite professors here she gave us this problem and nobody was able to solve it and i'm like trying to talk to all these students and i'm like hey guys have you figured this out and they're like no we haven't and we go to her office hours and and of course the teachers don't straight away give the answers 
and she's like giving us hints, et cetera. And then finally, when they released the solution, you know, the solution was, it didn't have a solution. So we were like, why would you give us that? So our teacher was like, oh, this is what, this is how it is in real life. You know, not every problem has a solution. So you need to learn to manage your time. So these are like some very interesting experiences that I had about how the education system works here. Um, yeah, let me know. I hope I answered your question about that. Um, and what was the last question? I'm sorry, I forgot. The internship. Internship, okay. So my first in internship was actually at Jindal Steel uh, in, in um, Kalmeshwar. So I, how did I get that? Uh, I just knew like uh, my friend's father worked there. And I just actually, I just like really begged him to give me a job because I wanted to get some industry experience. And it was not a very heavy data science related. It was just basic uh, statistics, descriptive statistics, but it, it was a good experience. Like I worked there for a month and I just did some descriptive uh, analysis of some of the data they had. Still better than having no industry experience, I would say. So that was my first internship. The second internship that I got was here, and it was like a six week internship, and that was pretty data science heavy. So I did like a natural language processing model where um, basically in that company, the customers, you know, how we put comments on Facebook and YouTube. So I had to do like a sentiment and analysis of those comments. So whether that comment was happy, sad, or angry. So yeah, that's like another internship uh, I did, and that was my main focus in that internship. Um, any other questions? These are great questions, so keep them coming. Oh, I see one in the chat. What mistakes did you make while going through this journey? Oh my God. Oh, wow, okay. So let me start by answering Ishita's question. What mistakes did I make? Um, oh, so many mistakes. For the first one I made was I assumed, like I mentioned, I assumed that just doing my master's is going to be enough to get a job. So that was my biggest mistake. It, it's not true. And the other mistake that I made was um, this was just like underestimating what life can be here. It is, uh, it is, it is, it is struggling, but it's, uh, but yeah. Uh, it, it's not very easy, but at the same time, it teaches you a lot in life. So I think I underestimated how I would survive here. Um, and going to this next question, has internships gotten easier with newer tools? Um, can you explain what you mean by newer tools? I think it's from Kunal. You can talk to me too. Kunal Chaturvedi, you can switch on your mic and talk to ma'am. Um, hello. Hi. Uh, uh, yes, so uh, by newer tools, uh, actually, uh, I framed it poorly, but uh, I, I wanted to ask, uh, like with the new websites and all, uh, we have, uh, let's say, Glassdoor or something, uh, we have uh, newer websites and oh. newer platforms with so many listings and also does it does it make the process easier or does it make it hard because now we have more competition uh, between students great question um i think the those new websites like linkedin and glassdoor like you're an indeed and all that you're talking about it definitely makes applying to like hundreds and hundreds of uh, applications very easy uh, fun fact i think i applied to over thousands application thousand jobs it's crazy, I know. Uh, so it, that definitely is helpful. Um, so when you apply for a lot of jobs, I guess your probability of getting an interview increases. So in that way, perhaps it gets a bit easier. But in my opinion, what always got me an interview is when I used my network connections that I built during a conference or on LinkedIn and asked them to see if they have a role and, and if they do they will refer me to the role and that's how I got an interview so that's how actually I even got my job here at Harmonize so the co-founder of my previous internship company referred me to the CEO of this company and that way I got a job here so to answer your question yes that's helpful but it's more of a numbers game but and but at the same time if you really want to get a job and like more quickly I think um for me, connections is more of a quality game. So uh, I always rely on my connections. 
Um, did you get a scholarship for study abroad or, or is IELTS necessary? Uh, good question. Um, so I didn't actually get a scholarship, but when I was working as a teaching assistant, I got uh, half of my tuition waived for three semesters because I was working there as a as a teacher as a TA. So I didn't exactly it's not exactly considered a scholarship, but I did get some financial waiver in that case. Is IELTS necessary? Um, well, it depends from university to university. Sometimes they want TOEFL. Sometimes some universities don't even care about GRE. Um, so it depends, I would say. Uh, what year actually you got your job at Harmonize? Great question. So it was in January 2020. And how did COVID affect you and your company? Oh, wow. Fantastic question. We gained a lot from COVID. We were not, of course, it's not a happy situation, but we were able to help a lot of people uh, who were going through COVID because, as I said, we help patients monitor at their home. And so when hospitals didn't have any space for more patients, we were really able to use our app and, and the equipments to manage patients from their home. So it, it we really, we kind of benefited, my company benefited from that. We got a lot of patients joining us at that time. Okay, what should we do to be able to be hireable just after graduation? Um, well, like I mentioned in my presentation, um, perhaps I can share a screenshot of the last slide. I think that was really important. Just have some, um, you know, skills on your resume, passion projects, internship perhaps, and start applying for jobs before you graduate. Oh my God, this is so important. Just start applying at least three months before you graduate. So right after when you're finished your graduations, you're likely to have a job. Uh, what is your responsibility as a data analyst? Which strong skills or statistical tools would you recommend? Um, so my data analyst responsibilities is, uh, like I mentioned, is for dashboarding and doing data analysis, um, uh, uh, data modeling to understand the data better. And which school, which skills uh, would you recommend? I think uh, technically uh, Python and R are really important especially Python, in my opinion, and SQL. So those would be the tools I recommend. Um, is it better to go after unpopular skills for higher paying jobs for better chance? Unpopular skills? Um, well, I would recommend sticking to the popular skills because most people are using that, so it will increase your uh, chances of getting hired. And always note that sometimes you don't have all the tools, right? It's not possible. So sometimes people end up learning new tools during their job. So uh, for example, I, I became an expert at SQL during my job uh, before I just knew the basics. Um, financially, who or what was your support and how much money it took when you moved there without a job? Well, financially, uh, I, for me, it was a combination of uh, getting an education loan from the bank and, uh, and I was also supported by my family. And in terms of the financial structure, it, it keeps changing from university to university and also every single year. So you would have to look up the most updated um, tuition data for whichever university you're perhaps interested in. Uh, I could see you haven't done C and C++ in your LinkedIn. Aren't they necessary? Oh, great. Um, actually, in my in my, uh, what I'm working on, it's it's not necessary because I'm purely on data and not doing anything beyond that. Uh, for me, I don't have to use those tools at all. Uh, Python and R do do the job for me. But that was a great question. Wow, I'm so happy I got I got to answer your questions. Uh, let me know if you have any more. Oh, there's one more. How much was the education loan? I I don't exactly remember. Um, any other question? Okay. Okay, I guess that's for all. Great. Um, can we move forward? Okay, there's one question. So at what year you started learning, ma'am? Um, what year I started earning? I started earning uh, almost three months after I came to US where I worked as a, as a waitress at a cafeteria. 
So that's when I started earning. And then I got the teaching assistantship and then I got a full-time job like I have right now. Uh, would you like to suggest from where you can learn R? Um, that's a good question. I, I personally did not learn R online. I mostly relied on what was taught in the class. And there is a website called Udemy, right? So you can go to Udemy and look for R courses, but they are paid. So, uh, and but just because they are paid, I think you do get a certificate at the end and you can put that on your LinkedIn profile. Um, otherwise, I think there will be a lot of free sources too to learn R. So if you just Google that, I think you'll find something. What suggestions will you give me as a web developer? Um, <laughs> that's a good question, but uh, well, I wish I had an answer, but I, I am not an expert in that field, so I would not want to give you any wrong suggestions. But I guess I am, generically speaking, it's a free world because it's because of the internet. So you can pick up any any uh, thing you want to learn on the internet. And I would recommend you, Vaishnavi, to go on LinkedIn connect with web developers on LinkedIn and ask them this question and they will give you fantastic suggestions. All right, any new? Okay, as a data analyst, what are the main topics of statistics you're focused on? Um, you're welcome, Vaishnavi. Uh, as a data analyst, uh, main topics. Um, well, I, I mean, there are no any such main topics or the main tools that I use. I think A-B test is something that we use on a daily basis. It's like a, it's a no-brainer game. But besides that, we just use, so how it happens in real life is you need to solve a problem and then you decide, okay, what tool should I use? What tool will best help me find the solution to the problem? So it really depends from problem to problem and, and how you want to solve it. Uh, to have like uh, to use your concepts from statistics, but to answer your question, I think A/B test is like the main and the most commonly used thing in my company, at least. Um, Devanshu, what is, what is the main difference between a data analytics and data scientist? Oh, what a great question! Um, in my opinion, it there really isn't a lot of difference, you know, because people. So for example, my job, I can also be called as a data scientist. And, and some people are, like some people do exactly the kind of job that I do, but in their company, their title is data scientist. So at the end of the day, data is data, but usually data scientists is like more heavy towards data modeling, prediction, machine learning, whereas data analysts is like slightly on the lower side where we are using statistics mainly for uh, business, uh, for business development and for uh, yeah, business growth. Um, okay, so what are the key things a data analyst should know? Um, well, the key things are the technical tools, like I said. So I think data visualization, like how you present your data, is a very, very key thing that I did not mention in my, uh, forgot to mention in my uh, presentation. So I think that's one of the things. And you can, you know, you need to know how to set up dashboards where you use the visualization and uh, tools like Python and R. Uh, regarding your company, do you always get to use ML or inferences from statistics work most of the time? Well, yeah, yeah, definitely. We, we do use that um, because uh, we are the data team and any data problem, ha most of the time, 99% of the time requires the use of statistical knowledge, uh, even something as basic as median and average and percentiles and distributions are used uh, on a daily basis in my company. Great question. Okay. All right. Are there any questions left? Maybe I'll post my LinkedIn um, here and you guys can connect with me. And if you have any more, questions uh, you can shoot me up there so i'll just yes, post my link that would be really helpful here okay. there's my link there's, there's one more question could you en enlighten oh, us yeah. on data visualization oh yeah that's a that's a good one too um i think anup 
uh, data enlightened on data and visualization, I think one thing that I've learned is that keeping it simple, uh, having fewer elements on your in your presentation or your dashboard. So, and in such a way that even a person who is not who doesn't have a background in statistics is able to just look at your chart and understand what's going on. So you really need to simplify your finding. And it really depends on data to data how you want to visualize it, like whether it should be a line graph or a bar graph or a pie chart. It depends on the situation. But yeah, keeping it very simple for layman um, is, is the best way to visualize data. OK, one last question. Uh, how much UX did you learn on the job? Uh, I did not. I did not have to learn UX uh, at my job, so so none. Okay, moving forward. Thank you, ma'am, for clearing okay. our doubts. Thanks and for the questions. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, our second guest in honor for the day is Mr. Mayur Mahurkar sir, who is currently working as a data scientist at. And assemble AI, a Swedish Indian startup. Sir completed his graduation in 2004 from the Rampet MP Dev Memorial Science College, Nagpur, with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Statistics, Mathematics, and Computer Science combination of subjects. After that, he pursued his Master's of Science degree in Statistics from Government Institute of Science, Nagpur, and achieved it by 2016. In the very same year, Sir started working as a contributory lecturer in Dharampet MP Dev Memorial Science College, Nagpur. After working there for around two years, he got an opportunity to work in the prestigious Indian Institute of Management, Nagpur, as an academic associate for the econometrics subject, which was also his last job before joining in symbol AI. Sir possesses expertise in deep learning for computer vision and machine learning. My, uh, his core capabilities are in Python, TensorFlow, Power BI, and other data. I would like to invite Mr. Mayur Mahurkar sir to please take up the platform and acknowledge us with his golden words on statistics, the core of machine learning. Please, sir. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for this uh, wonderful introduction. And um, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Department of Statistics, uh, Department of Computer Science of College, Nagpur, uh, for uh, interacting with the students. Um, and I'm really happy to be here and to interact with the students. And I'll, I'll try to give my best to uh, enlighten them and uh, trying to orient them towards this uh, wonderful field, uh, wonderful field I come from. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, I'll get started and just give me a moment so that I can share my screen. Yeah, uh, so I hope uh, everyone can see my screen. Yep. Yeah, thank you very much for the confirmation. Uh, so the topic uh, today I'll be speaking on uh, is uh, uh, statistics, uh, the core of machine learning. And uh, um, uh, I assume that uh, most of you uh, have uh, almost no knowledge of machine learning or maybe possibly hearing it, hearing it the first time or maybe uh, you have heard it from, uh, you know, uh, from either social media or newspaper or if, if you follow uh, something related to, uh, you know, statistics or, uh, or are you a part of any group. So I'll be trying to, uh, you know, give you a short introduction about machine learning so that you can better understand it. And uh, you can, uh, you know, next time if you read anything about machine learning or uh, let's say data science, uh, you can have better understanding of it. Um, so since I have been already introduced, uh, introduced, I can skip this slide and uh, uh, I'll, I'll jump into introducing my company. Uh, because uh, I'm assuming that uh, um, like a very few of you will uh, may be knowing about what exactly is computer vision, and uh, so that so that whenever I'm giving an example about my company or anything, uh, you can actually have a grasp of the context uh, which I'm talking about. So uh, 
Ensemble.ai uh, is actually a Swedish Indian startup and it was founded officially in 2019 and um, we are primarily delivering artificial intelligence solutions uh, specifically in the areas of uh, quality inspection, uh, damage detection and safety surveillance. Um, uh, till now uh, our major clients are Mahindra and Mahindra Group, uh, Solar Industries, uh, Economic Explosive Industries, uh, uh, India Climate Limited, and also we have uh, uh, an overseas client uh, uh, which is Apresito. So Apresito is basically a car rental, uh, uh, you know, startup from South America. Uh, apart from that, we are also, uh, you know, trying to uh, communicate with some uh, industries in Australia, uh, basically into uh, safety surveillance. Uh, so, just to give you an idea about what I do on the daily basis and what kind of solution our comp uh, my company make, uh, I have prepared a few slides. So, uh, so I hope here you can see that uh, it, th this image is, is actually a kind of a machinery. Uh, so, let me just clear that uh, it's actually uh, uh, the cutoff portion of uh, Mahindra and Mahindra tractors. Right, and here you can see that there is actually a device with uh, two uh, lights, uh, red and green. And let me just uh, quickly go because you actually can't see what exactly we are trying to do here. It's just to, uh, you know, give you idea that uh, like how things look uh, from uh, from this different perspective. So this is how uh, this device looks, right? So it is actually uh, looking at these three clips, which they call clips. Uh, these are actually really very really tiny, uh, possibly uh, less tiny than a safety pin. And, uh, you know, the, the workers there actually bend this pin so that this hook won't, uh, uh, you know, release uh, during the action of uh, the pistons, right? Uh, so now the problem statement here was uh, if, um, you know, these clips actually are not properly bent, uh, it may be hazardous and it may actually, uh, you know, uh, be really, really crucial uh, for the for the user, right? So we actually made a kind of a machine learning model which can actually track these clips and uh, uh, whenever all the three clips are perfectly bent, it will, uh, you know, let green and it will uh, move ahead. So it, it, it is actually looking still. Uh, but uh, in the real life, it happens on a conveyor belt. So it's like the device is held there and on the conveyor belts, uh, a lot of such uh, open up engines are passing and uh, every time uh, the machine detects whether it is right or not. Uh, this is another uh, case uh, in which we are currently working on. Uh, so this is basically a PP. Right now, don't get confused with the PP. <laughs> we unfortunately have to unfortunately have to see <laughs> during this Corona pandemic. But uh, this PP is actually related to uh, the safety, uh, specifically at construction and mining sites. Uh, and I think um, I'll be able to actually show you a real uh, life uh, demo. Uh, so I'll be uh, asking Nikhil to please show the screen because uh, he is currently uh, you know, managing that Linux system. So I'll be just pausing my uh, uh, video uh, uh, video sharing for now so that I can share that screen. Okay, so just bear for a moment. Yeah, so I hope Nikhil, uh, are you ready? Yeah. So yeah, I hope you all can see uh, Nikhil here. Uh, so uh, like there is actually, so, yeah, so this is the system right here. So uh, you can pretty much uh, see that whenever Nikhil wears the helmet, it's light, lit up green and it says, yeah, uh, you are safe. And whenever he took off the helmet, uh, it will uh, it will raise an alarm possibly in the, in the, in the actual scenario. Uh, like the lags which you are seeing is because of the screen sharing. Uh, because in screen sharing, the FPS are uh, kind of low, uh, but you can see, and uh, uh, so this is how it works. I'll, uh, in fact, I can also go there and prove that this is not some kind of monkey business. So just give me a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so hey guys, uh, if uh, you can actually see me, so uh, here you can see that uh, we are actually in the red uh, because I haven't wear the helmet and 
Nikhil, could you please give me the helmet or possibly I can use this one right here. Uh, so when I wear the helmet, it says, yeah, you are safe. So that's it. Um, so yeah, uh, so I hope you get the idea what kind of work I do uh, usually. Uh, so I'll request to Nikhil to uh, turn off this. Uh, Turn off the share screen so that I can continue. Yeah, thank you, Nikhil. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I hope my screen is resumed now. Can anyone just confirm? Yep. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, apart from that, there are some other, uh, you know, problem statement which we have successfully worked on. Uh, so this is actually an automatic number plate recognition. Uh, here we can see that uh, this is actually a vehicle, and uh, you know, even for a very difficult angle, uh, uh, the machine learning model. Yeah. Hi, I don't know if it's just me, but I, I actually couldn't see your screen anymore. Yeah, just just a minute. I think uh, like there is a technical glitch, so I'll just resume. Uh, yeah, can, is it is it like can you see it now? Yeah, it's visible. Great. Uh, so this is the problem statement I was talking about. So this is actually an automatic number plate recognition, uh, which is actually used for surveillance and uh, you know safety. So this machinery model actually captures uh, uh, the license plate and uh, it actually uh, reads that license plate and login. So uh, you know you you must have seen uh, negligence uh, from the from the watchman or you know. Uh, uh, wherever safety is needed, uh, so it is really really helpful there. Uh, apart from that, we are not actually limited to just photos, but we can also work on X-rays and radiology. Here is an example. This is actually uh, a, a dummy piece of uh, uh, you know a dummy piece of a machine learning model uh, which we have given to the client, uh, right? And uh, just for the confidentiality issue, I can't. Uh, you know, name the client, but uh, here you can see that this is actually uh, X-ray, like you usually, if you have ever gone to, uh, you know, airport security, uh, your baggage are gen uh, your baggages are generally, uh, you know, uh, passed through an X-ray machine. So this is how uh, uh, the the images came from the X-ray machine, and here you can see that it is actually, a, you know, kind of a pen pouch or something. Uh, so here uh, you can see that uh, uh, there is also a pen. If you can see it closely, this is the nip here, and some some stapler pins, and possibly this is an ID card. But uh, uh, wherever there is a potential, uh, you know, security threat such as knife or blade, which is actually prohibited, uh, such as in uh, you know airport security, it will definitely detect it. Uh, right. And uh, similarly, uh, this is actually an example of vehicle damage inspection, uh, uh, which we uh, uh, we are actually giving to a presidio uh, since uh, uh, it is really important for them to keep a track of their rental cars. So uh, so this can actually detect three kinds of damages such as dent scratches and uh, if there is any kind of tear. Right. Uh, so so there are uh, many other solutions uh, which we are trying to work on and uh, which we try to deliver. So I hope uh, you get the idea of what computer vision is and how we are working stuff here. Um, so, so let's get back to the main topic, which is machine learning. Uh, so since I, I start talking about how statistics is used in machine learning and how much uh, uh, relying of statistics, uh, uh, how much relying of machine learning is on statistics. Uh, let me just, uh, you know, try to uh, make you guys understand in a very simple way what what actually machine learning is, right? And I hope you enjoy it. Uh, so, starting with the definition of machine learning, machine learning is actually uh, a set of algorithms that the computer systems use uh, to perform uh, some specific task and uh, uh, without being uh, uh, giving explicit instructions. And it solely relies on the patterns and inferences instead, right? And uh, uh, strictly speaking, machine learning is actually a, a subfield of artificial intelligence, 
and uh, there is something also called deep learning uh, which comes out to be uh, the subset of machine learning itself and uh, typically deep learning uh, is used when we are trying to solve much complex problems such as uh, object recognition and damage detection and, and thing right so uh, now this definition could be a bit confusing especially for those who are uh, you know seeing it the very first time because you know you just mentioned that you'll be using computer systems and then uh, there are claims that machine learning is actually different from traditional programming so how is it that's possible now uh, to to give an explanation to give an explanation to a cs background student i would like to defer it like in traditional programming uh, you actually feeds the system or the computer the data and the underlying rules or program you say and you are expecting an output from the computer but in machine learning it's like you gave the data as well as the outcome to the computer and then the machine will try to build some rules some kind of uh, you know pattern it will try to track some pattern there and then next time you feed in the data only you can expect a, a good output or a, a prediction which is really close to the output right so i hope uh, uh, i was able to convey uh, the idea of machine learning to the ca students and uh, i will not be uh, you know very much surprised if the statistics people are still scratching their head uh, and not uh, understanding what i am trying to say so for you guys i'm simplifying this example so here you can see that uh, in traditional programming it's basically you will give the ingredients as well as the recipe to the machine and in the output you can expect pizza out of it uh, but in the case of machine learning it's kind of different so uh, you will sh uh, you will show the ingredients and let's say you can show the photograph of the pizza that you wanted and the machine can actually give you uh, the recipe out of it right okay uh, so <laughs> i hope it was uh, you know funny enough and uh, uh, you know easy enough example Uh, but if you still have questions just hold your horses because i have a very simple example to make you guys understand uh so uh just a simple question for all of you can you just uh, predict what could be the output for uh, the fifth uh, you know row so you can just uh, drop your uh, uh, you know answers or uh, some of you can actually done yeah can can i can i 26 yeah so great uh, so i think everyone is uh, uh, you know okay with 26 that 26 is actually an answer and you all are uh, you are actually right that 26 is the answer but the key point of discussion is actually how you reach to that answer right possibly uh, you must have observed the pattern in the data so for like if you just look at the first row it says that if you give me a uh, give input as one you will get output as two now there could be many ways to get a two out of one so uh, like you can you can square and add one uh, you can just add one you can cube and then add one so there are basically many ways so just by the first instance you cannot be very sure what exactly is the underlying pattern here so that is why uh, you actually go on and look at the second one and uh, then uh, you gain a bit of confidence uh, and then the third one and by the time you are at the fourth row you are pretty much confident that this is the underlying rule there right so this this small process which actually happened here in mind is what we are calling machine learning right and we are actually expecting such kind of thinking from a machine not from a, a real human and that is why it is named as machine learning right uh, so i hope i made it clear um about what machine learning is uh, again uh, you know discussing about machine learning in depth is a separate topic so uh, i hope for the introduction part it is sufficient enough right uh, so talking about uh, a brief history of machine learning uh, uh, you know the first use case of machine learning was from uh, world war 2 when a british computer scientist named alan turing uh, tried to encode uh, you know decode the enigma code which was used by the german forces uh, and it was really really difficult task at that time uh, just to just to know more about that particular incident and uh, what happened with alan turing uh, you can actually see 
uh, uh, a great movie, which is uh, the Imitation Game, uh, the Imitation Game, starring uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, you guys possibly know him by the name of Doctor Strange from Avengers. Uh, so, guys, you can you can actually spend some time over this movie. That that really is a great movie, right? Uh, just after that, so so the first image right here is actually the bombing machine, uh, which Alan Turing created to decode all those messages. Anyway. Uh, so, just after a few years, Arthur Samuel actually coined the term machine learning and uh, 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 the second image right here is Arthur Samuel and uh, here uh, just below that image uh, is uh, Arthur Samuel working on a IBM 700 series computers uh, uh, to, be, to be very spe uh, specific it is 7, 702 and he actually created a game of checkers Right, where the computer was actually learning from its mis mistake and every time you play with the computer, uh, the computer becomes really smart. So these were some of the you know, early examples of machine learning, but nowadays you have no idea but you are dealing with machine learning every day. Right? So I hope everyone uses a smartphone and every smartphone nowadays have a face unlock feature. Uh, so the underlying concept behind the face unlock feature is actually machine learning. It's, it's actually machine learning algorithm, uh, which is trying to match your face uh, at the time of registering. Apart from that, you must have also seen a Facebook detecting automatically detecting the people who might be in the in the in the images which you have just uploaded or posted, right? So that is that is again a machine learning algorithm. You know, helping you to to see uh, uh, or to tag the people. Apart from that, uh, you know, you must have gone to shopping on Amazon or Flipkart, or even you are not a very uh, great fan uh, fan of online shopping. You must be possibly using YouTube or Spotify, right? So uh, you must be getting uh, recommendations every day. Uh, so how are that those recommendations coming? Uh, you know, precisely, uh, there there is no specific code running just for you because uh, you know almost uh, you know seven uh, you know half of the population on Earth is using YouTube, so it is it is actually not possible um, to uh, to write a code specifically for each person. It's actually a machine learning algorithm which is recommending you all the stuff. Uh, talking about some more example, if you frequently use Gmail, uh, you must have known or you must have seen a spam folder. Uh, which actually consists uh, consists of email, uh, emails which are potential spam. So how do you think it is happening? How does Google know that uh, what kind of uh, email is a spam and what kind of uh, uh, email is genuine? Actually, again, there is a machine learning model working behind that stuff, and uh, there are tons of example like the 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 chat box, the voice assistant such as Siri or uh, Amazon Alexa. They are all relying on machine learning algorithms, right? So I hope you get the idea of how uh, you know machine learning uh, has become the part of your life, and you actually don't know. Now, moving to the main stuff of uh, this talk, uh, uh, what exactly is the role of statistics in machine learning? Uh, because as of now, you have spoken everything about or uh, everything which comes to be. I'm sorry, which is uh, really really related to either web development or computer science. So, where exactly uh, statistics kicks in? Well, uh, let me just uh, share you this table which I have prepared. Uh, prepared, and here you can see that uh, these are various tools and topics of statistics which are directly applied in the field of data science and machine learning. Right. So, if you talk about uh, descriptive statistics, uh, you know now these topics may be known or unknown to you depending on uh, what degree year you are in. Uh, and uh, there are also some topics which uh, are actually part of postgraduate uh, degree of statistics. But nevertheless, nevertheless, they are actually part of uh, statistics. So uh, you know, descriptive statistics things such as standard tendency, dispersion, and everything, uh, it is actually used in something called exploratory data analysis. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, EDA is actually used to uh, find out the general patterns in the data, and just to write a an early report of uh, you know the data set like how exactly is the pattern in the data is there any kind of anomaly in the data or is there any kind of missing observation and and sort of other stuff and the same could be used in the case of dashboarding dashboarding and madhumita has already spoken about dashboarding so uh, i'll i'll skip that stuff but still if you have anything to ask you can ask it in the q and a um, 
right? Data visualization is also there. Uh, so actually data visualization is uh, heavily a part of exploratory data analysis because ultimately the main aim of exploratory data analysis or EDA, what we call is to, you know, to make a general report of the data, which can be understood by, by even a person who have no background in statistics or machine, or machine learning. Uh, apart from that, probability normal distribution is actually included in the whole ML. Like you just cannot uh, imagine the field of machine learning without uh, probability theory and normal distribution. Apart from that, uh, other distributions such as binomial distributions and multinomial distributions, they are actually included in the classification problem, uh, which falls under the supervised uh, machine learning category, which which actually is a as a subcategory of machine learning, uh, right? And apart from that, uh, talking about my field in image processing, I uh, heavily deal with uh, you know the beta distribution and the gamma distribution and the Laplace distribution wherever I have to uh, you know make uh, you know the deals with the images and whenever I have to process the images so that I can get to a particular criteria. Apart from that, correlation and regression is uh, you know uh, absolutely basis of what we call as supervised machine learning, right? Apart from that, there is also something called logistic regression, which is actually part of generalized regression model. Uh, this topic is actually included in the PG, but it is again a very common topic in supervised machine learning, uh, which is actually used in both classification problem. And there is also a, a, a very, a very uh, you know, sophisticated field called neural network of machine learning. Apart from that, uh, clustering is used in uh, the category which is called as unsupervised machine learning. And now, uh, I'm not spending much of time to you know explain what exactly unsupervised machine learning mean because uh, I'm I'm strictly uh, you know uh, uh, bounding my talk to statistics and how it is used in machine learning. But I'll be really happy to speak over this if you want. Uh, apart from that, as Madhumita has already uh, given you the hint that uh, she really deals with A-B testing and, uh, uh, you know, she has already told that A-B testing is just, uh, you know, T-test given a fancy name. Uh, so you can pretty much imagine that what whatever is in the hypothesis testing, it naturally comes into uh, A-B testing or clinical testing or, uh, you know, the trial testings, right? So after seeing this table and this compar uh, comparison, which I just uh, draw, you know, th there could be an obvious statement such as, right, so, so machine learning is nothing but statistics, like there is nothing new and, uh, you know, it just got famous, uh, you know, maybe they glorified some of the things uh, from statistics, they gave them fancy names such as supervised, unsupervised, feature selection and everything and they just gained the glory and statistics is left behind. Uh, now this 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 very statement is actually really really debatable and there are many heated debate over this and uh, to be to be really really blunt uh, you know the main parties who are always debating over this is actually the computer science community and the statistics community. So basically, uh, from the statistics community, the blame is always like that uh, you are actually stealing our stuff, giving them fancy names, and then uh, you are gaining all the popularity. And then uh, you will see, uh, you know, some some uh, you know statements like if, if you are calling uh, machine learning as glorified statistics, then physics is just glorified math. Zoology is just glorified stamp collection, and architecture is just glorified stamp stamp castle construction. So, uh, just 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 for the advice, do, don't ever get into this conversation or or debate because it will end nowhere, right? But uh, definitely, I will. And and such kind of heated debate actually gives us such kind of hilarious memes. And these are some of the one which are my personal favorites, right? So, uh, the one on the on the leftmost leftmost corner is my favorite. So, this actually is a presentation where. Uh, where data scientist is getting all the notice and statistician is just left behind. Um, anyways, uh, so so this discussion or this debate is mostly endless and you will see a lot of people fighting over it. Uh, but let me just, uh, uh, you know, clear some of the dissimilarities between statistics and machine learning, which I have felt and which uh, most of the machine learning uh, 
uh, people will agree if you have a, if they also have a sound knowledge of statistics. Uh, so the major three differences uh, between or the dissimilarities between statistics and machine learning comes from uh, the purpose, evaluation, and the assumptions. Right. So first of all, uh, you know, uh, in statistics, whenever we are uh, we are actually building a model uh, which we call as fitting, uh, but in machine learning it is called as training. Okay. So so whenever we uh, we are train uh, we are fitting a statistical model. Uh, our primary purpose is to understand and to infer the relationship between variables. Whereas when it comes to machine learning, uh, they hardly care about the relationship between the variables, and their primary focus is to get most uh, accurate, uh, the most accurate predictions as possible, right? And again, when it comes to evaluation in statistics, uh, you know most of the model fitting. Uh, uh, the evaluation for the model fitting is done by uh, the use of hypothesis testing, p values, and confidential intervals and some stuff. But uh, highly, you know, machine learning don't believe in such kind of uh, uh, you know uh, heavily involved, heavily statistically involved stuff. They simply have the idea of uh, you know something called validation state uh, test and test it. So what basically they do is they will divide the the whole data set into three parts. One will be called as training part, which will be used for model fitting. And after you get uh, the parameters or weights, as they say, from uh, that fitting, they will keep on testing, right? And and the process will be repeated, right? They will keep on testing. If they are not satisfied with the result, right? They will have some kind of feature engineering, or they will, you know, try to, uh, you know, transform some of the data, maybe include some some external data or maybe reducing some data as they call it feature selection and they will solely keep repeating this process until and unless they get the desired result right and for the same and just for the same purpose they are ready to you know negate assumption if they are happy with it right and the best example i can give you is something uh, which is called as naive bayes algorithm right so naive base is actually called naive because it simply neglect, uh, neglect uh, the fundamental idea of Bayes theorem, right? And it simply suggests that every uh, uh, you know variable or every feature is uncorrelated, uh, independent of each other, right? So these are some of the dis dissimilarities between statistics and machine learning. Now I'll be not talking much about it because uh, you know, as I already told you, that this talk could be endless, right? But definitely, if uh, some of the faculty or even the students uh, are interested, uh, there is a paper uh, uh, titled "Statistical Modeling: The Two Cultures," uh, which was from Leo Bremen, uh, which came in 2001, and that is a fabulous paper, uh, which uh, clearly uh, you know give you idea that how exactly machine learning takes over and gain the popularity where statistics actually lose its uh, charm, right? So I'll be dropping uh, the link of this paper after my talk. So I'll be happy to share those uh, that paper with you. Right, so as I already told you that uh, this is a very heated debate and I don't actually want you to get into that. What I want you to get, uh, you know, the best of it. Right. So this is this Venn diagram is actually uh, uh, you know uh, giving you the idea of a fruitful association of both statistics and computer science. Right. So here you can see that uh, uh, when you are applying statistics and you basically have a domain expertise. Right. Uh, now uh, I would definitely try to uh, you know clear that uh, when I, when I speak about statistics here. Uh, it actually include some basic use of computer science because obviously when you come to business, the data is huge and you can't expect anyone uh, to analyze the data by hand, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm actually including here some basic software such as SPSS or uh, SAS or MATLAB here, right? Uh, whereas when you when it comes to core programming such as Python and R, uh, right? Uh, uh, when it when it comes with association with statistics, you know, uh, it actually uh, gives machine learning algorithms, right? Okay, and this sweet spot right here is where all the magic happens, right? So once you are uh, well aware with machine learning and you started 
uh, uh, you know, um, collaborate, uh, making an association of machine learning with whatever domain you are working in, right? The magic really started to happen, and that magic is called data science or artificial intelligence or or uh, or, or simply data science, right? Okay. So, so enough of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, data science and everything. Uh, you know, since you are student and uh, you know most likely you are very much concerned about your future ahead. So let me just uh, uh, take a few more moments to speak about what exactly is the scope of data science, both in global and Indian uh, scenario, right? So first of all, uh, machine learning is actually a field which is not restricted to any domain, right? So there are thousands of examples and the best part of machine learning is that you can actually apply machine learning in any kind of way, right? So if you are really interested into finance and banking, uh, uh, you can solve problem statements such as credit scoring, fraud detection, risk analysis, or uh, trade exchange forecast and uh, something related to forecasting uh, in the perspective of uh, finance. Uh, when it comes to retail, I have only uh, already given you examples such as you know recommendations or fraud detection or even the customer segmentations. Uh, when it comes to marketing, uh, there is a very very crucial uh, crucial uh, you know problem statement which is called as churn. So if you don't know what exactly is churn, churn is actually when uh, uh, you know where where your customer actually leaves you and uh, you know switch to another. Uh, you know the rival company. So the biggest churn happened when Geo, uh, when uh, Reliance uh, launched Geo, right? So that 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 is the biggest example of churn when many of the people left their current uh, you know uh, telecom provider and switched to Geo, right? Okay. Uh, when it comes to travel and booking, it is something uh, uh, I think uh, uh, you are aware that uh, if you frequented travel. Uh, there are some trains which uh, are known to have a dynamic pricing on their tickets, right? So that dy dynamic pricing is actually price optimization, and in the back end, it is actually using a machine learning algorithm which is trying to balance the demand and supply there. And in the healthcare also, uh, there are numerous, uh, uh, you know, examples. In fact, Madhumita. Uh, already uh, stated you an example how she is in daily life uh, using data science, uh, you know, data analysis and statistics uh, uh, in the welfare of uh, public health. Apart from that, uh, there is another field too, right? Uh, typically, my field, uh, which is actually uh, presenting more complex example uh, such as object recognition and movie recommendations and many more, right? So you can see that. Uh, you, you can you can hardly spot any any domain where uh, machine learning cannot be applied. So definitely, uh, machine learning like if you if you understand machine learning, if you if you uh, grab knowledge of it, you can easily go to any domain you want, right? So here are some of the top companies, uh, top global companies which are using machine learning in day-to-day -day life, and you can actually see every uh, you know. Every popular name here, such as Google, Apple, Facebook, Airbnb, Microsoft, NASA, Accenture, Netflix, uh, Walmart, PNG, Yelp, and whatnot. And 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 believe me, uh, like I I put whatever I can put in this uh, I could put in this slide, but the list is really really uh, you know lengthy, right? And if I if I try to name all of them, it will take me ages, right? But you know, judging from this, you can pretty much understand what exactly is the scope of the global scope of machine learning, right? Talking about the Indian scenario, right? The scope of machine learning is not less in the Indian scenario too. Uh, you know, here are some of the stats uh, 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 from both the studies of Gartner and NASCOM. Uh, so, according to the study of Gartner, uh, there. They suggested that uh, there are around 10 lakh plus registered companies in India, and almost 75% of them have uh, invested in A, uh, in AI and ML. And if not, they will be uh, mostly, you know, investing it, right? So there is a lot of money uh, uh, which will be pushed into data science and machine learning. Apart from that, if you talk about the worth of, uh, you know, the data analytics industry, particularly in India. Uh, so currently, it is valued somewhere around two billion dollars. 
uh, but uh, by the time of 2025, as NASCOM predicted, it, it could be 8x, like it will be going 2 billion to straight to 16 billion, right? So again, a very positive, uh, uh, you know, indication that, uh, you know, there will be a lot of, uh, you know, infrastructure building, uh, you know, since there is a lot of money coming in this particular scenario, this particular field, right? what kind of job roles you will be offered if you try to make a career into machine learning so here are some of the uh, major job roles which which uh, uh, you can you can offer right and so 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 job roles such as data analyst machine learning engineer ai developer deep learning engineer data scientist or computer scientist uh, which uh, you know maybe the computer um, students are much interested in and then uh, when when you actually try to get a get a more like a more intense kind of theory into it you can also be a AI research scientist right and talking about the salaries like you can pretty much imagine that since there will be a lot of uh, 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 you know uh, capital invested in this particular field right you can actually expect a lot more higher salary right so uh, this was a study from payscale.com and it suggested that the average salary package for a fresher compared to other fields uh, uh, rather than the data science it's actually around 4.18 lakhs right? so everything looks great uh, as of now but there is a major issue uh, with the current uh, machine learning scenario specifically in India and uh, the problem is uh, like the field of machine learning in AI is actually you know moving at a really really fast pace right and unfortunately unfortunately we uh, we are somewhere losing behind right and uh, uh, because of that uh, you know some of the some of the jobs will be displaced and 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 I'm not blaming AI because it will also create some more potential jobs but the key question here is are we ready for that and unfortunately the answer till now is no uh, uh, just for the just for putting another uh, stat here uh, the job postings uh, uh, or the people who are searching for uh, you know uh, successful candidate having uh, the sound knowledge of data science and statistics has reached all time high in 2017. So, so like in 20, 2017, you know, the industry were actually really much hungry to, uh, you know, hire data science people. But unfortunately, uh, there was a huge skill gap. Uh, and the skill gap is possibly because, you know, that the industry adapts uh, the major revolution which is happening uh, uh, quite quickly. But uh, our education, uh, uh, you know, the education field actually takes time uh, to adjust according to uh, that demand, right? And uh, you know, uh, even now uh, in most of the universities, uh, a proper curriculum is yet to be included in the mainstream education. And uh, you, you know, you can actually take your own case that by the time a proper curriculum will be put in, uh, you know, you will be off with your graduates, and uh, you will be like, you will mostly be struggling. Uh, because the people there uh, are expecting you to have knowledge of machine learning because you are already from a, from a statistics background or uh, you are a potential you know uh, IT candidate from computer science but when you will say that no I don't have any knowledge then that's really uh, is a, is a problem right so what could what could exactly be the solution to it right uh, like just for now you can actually start learning uh, machine learning and data science on your own and uh, uh, you know as Madhumita already suggested I would second that and I would really really uh, suggest you to you guys to actually uh, build some kind of machine learning club or something whatever you you guys would like like to call it uh, because uh, as I can uh, uh, imagine that I not now I have three kinds of uh, people here. One who is having the subject combination uh, such as statistics, mathematics, and computer science. So if you have that uh, that kind of uh, combination, first of all, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, you have chosen the best possible combination currently in the market, 
right? And you are really, really at a good selection, right? But if somehow you have skipped computer science or statistics, right? Don't lose your heart because that is where uh, you can actually trade, right? Uh, because both both the parties, both both kind of people have one subject to trade. As you know, I'll, I'll repeat what what Madhumita said. Uh, in, in her talk that, uh, uh, you know, the computer science people uh, can actually teach fundamentals of uh, compu uh, computer science and programming to statistics one and the statistics people can actually teach basic statistics to computer science and that is why I'm, I'm suggesting you to start a kind of a group or club, whatever you would like to call it, right? And uh, definitely I'll be, I'll be uh, you know, giving you some hints or at least some footsteps uh, uh, just so that uh, you will not start blank. Okay. So, so uh, whenever uh, someone asks me, hey, I just wanted to learn machine learning, uh, how can I start? Right. So, uh, my early two suggestions to him is learn Python and learn statistics. Now, again, uh, you know, these two are not sufficient, but they are really good, good to start with, uh, specifically Python, because it is really, really easy. Uh, right, coding in Python is just like uh, you know uh, formulating English uh, sentences in English. Right, uh, you just need to have a, a bit information about programming. So like it is not very intense, such as C and C plus plus. Right, and when you actually have a sound knowledge of uh, basic statistics and Python, you can actually take the next step and uh, you can actually try to learn such packages uh, such as NumPy, Pandas. Right, uh, so NumPy and Pandas, they are actually uh, very widely used in data analysis and uh, data wrangling. Uh, Matplotlib is actually a visualization library, uh, which you can use for visualization and dashboarding. Uh, and uh, Skykit Learn here is actually the core library, uh, which consists of all the algorithms, machine learning algorithm ready to go, right? So typically, uh, when a data scientist is at work, <laughs> this is the scenario right so here is the data and he'll be applying all these libraries one by one in a hope to get something out of it right so uh, i would i would also like to uh, you know uh, make you guys aware with the initiative which has been taken from ensemble uh, you know uh, i just mentioned that there is a heavy skill gap and that is not affecting the students, but that is also affecting the industry. Talking about my scenario, uh, you know, uh, when we started to hire some interns or some people to work with us, we actually have to, uh, you know, struggle a lot with them because even though they have some advanced degree, such as B, BE or BTEC in computer science, they still uh, struggles a lot in the concepts of machine learning and and, and and AI, right? Because uh, that that is completely out of their syllabus. Uh, so so as a general solution to this problem, uh, what we did, did is we tried to train them in house, right? So we actually uh, uh, you know hired them as a, uh, you know as a trainee, and then uh, we would like to train them and for for let's say two months or so and then uh, uh, we would like uh, we pick the best from them and that happened for around two or maybe two and a half years uh, but then the problem is really not uh, you know solvable uh, just by training because it actually costs company much and uh, you know uh, the people are not uh, really coping up with the job as well as the training right so that is why uh, Ensemble actually created a special wing called uh, Ensemble Academy, and uh, uh, under which uh, Ensemble Academy uh, we have we actually have some some uh, you know designated people. So this is actually Team Ensemble, or you can say Team Ensemble Academy. So you will see uh, you know a variety of expertise here, right? Uh, the expertise from statistics to computer science, uh, uh, you know, uh, and from other from other domain too. Uh, so these people uh, together are trying to solve this problem and uh, we are actually trying to orient people uh, specifically uh, to uh, computer science domains, statistics domains, 
right? And uh, uh, we are actually trying to orient them towards artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? Uh, so, so currently, uh, like as of now, as I told you, that either the training would be in house or we would actually collaborate with some kind of uh, uh, corporate uh, and uh, provide them corporate trainings. But now we are actually planning to conduct a series of workshops, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, collaborating just, just like in a collaboration, we are conducting this seminar. Uh, we highly uh, uh, like to conduct a workshop, right? And uh, during such series of, uh, you know, communication and interactions, we are trying to establish a channel and we are trying to fill that gap between the industry uh, and the academia, right? So if you if you feel really really interested of uh, you know uh, attending such kind of workshop or if you really want that such kind of workshop should uh, uh, you know should be beneficial to all of you you can actually contact your respective department and uh, then uh, we can communicate your department to organize such things right so what kind of difference we are trying to make here uh, you know first of all uh, you know we are trying to give you a kind of scheduled uh, piece of training in the form of workshops and seminars and con uh, and possibly conferences so that you guys uh, uh, you know uh, get aware and get oriented towards machine learning and data science because you guys are really really at a stage where you can make absolute absolute uh, future a really bright future all you need to uh, do is just uh, you know step ahead of your boundary you know step ahead of your typical syllabus, right? As I already told you, uh, if you are purely a statistics student, you know, don't be bound by statistics, you know, go beyond, uh, you know, Madhumita already told you that uh, it doesn't matter if you know statistics or not, but it really, really matters if you can't code it, right? So even if you have a sound knowledge of statistics, but if uh, but uh, you fail to code it, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you will actually fail to gain any kind of job, right? And uh, we will, uh, we would actually uh, be really, really glad if, uh, uh, you know, the academia or the people uh, uh, from the academics really try to reach in to create, uh, you know, a training system or, you know, to devise a kind of syllabus there, right? Just, just for the heads up, uh, one of my co-founder, uh, which is uh, Pankaj Meher, right uh, here in the middle, is actually uh, uh, is the com is the, is in the RT menu committee, uh, which is trying to devise uh, you know the AI curriculum. So with that uh, with that positive note, I hope that uh, you guys actually uh, now have uh, some knowledge of machine learning, and the next time. Uh, you will be and the next time when you see any post or any email or any blog related to machine learning or artificial intelligence you will find it more interesting now right so with this uh, I'll end my talk thank you very much uh, the platform is open for questions if anyone okay Akshar Bhaiya uh, yeah, I just would like to ask an uh, important question. Uh, yeah. Since your company is uh, related to giving solutions, so yeah. how to develop that key insight for problems solving or uh, just get getting more uh, into it with the problem solving kind of thing? How to develop it or sharpen those skills? Okay, so so first of all, um, you actually have asked a really really important question. Because uh, because I have seen that problem in many people who are actually aware of machine learning and data science, and they somehow manage to gain some kind of degree course or some kind of certification, uh, but they really really fail to practice it, right? So as uh, as an answer to your question, it is actually the practice which will make you perfect, right? So no doubt you will struggle initially to gain the insight. You know typically when you will see the data you will simply don't understand what what i have to do with the data because it's just simply numbers and you know some are some some of them are really not numbers so i actually have no idea what to do right but uh, that's where uh, platforms like uh, github uh, kaggle uh, you know these platforms actually uh, you know provide a really good uh, 
you know communication uh, uh, between you uh, who is actually a beginner into data science and machine learning and to the people who are actually expert into it right so from there you can you can actually observe their work right uh, it's really really free uh, so you can download their works uh, you can you know observe their work like like uh, what kind of uh, you know initial study they do with the data right and uh, see the best uh, the best part and the worst part of machine learning is the same that you just cannot uh, you know uh, uh, you know have an idea of it in a instance right you will have to practice you will have to make changes again and again uh, right and uh, uh, you actually need to uh, you know compare your work with someone who has actually previously worked on it right so i hope uh, uh, you know my answer satisfies you to it okay before moving to the next question i'll request everyone to please switch on their camera so that we can have a group photo like as an e group photo i should say i request everyone to please switch on their cameras for the group photo um one Are we done? So I can let join, let others join. Okay. I request the participants to please switch on their cameras so that we can proceed further. Are we done? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so I saw a question in the chat box. Uh, so it's from Chaitali, and she is asking, please give a basic idea how much is your average salary. So uh, Chaitali, uh, it's <laughs> actually a, a, a question uh, which uh, at the current stage I can't uh, uh, you know uh, you know give a straight answer because uh, you know. Uh, we are actually at a at a budding stage of uh, startup right so right now it is actually based the salary is uh, right now based on uh, the value of the project on which we are working on right so we have a designated role here right and uh, you know the more you work on it or the more difficult uh, statement you are working on um, you know the more you get the part from the project but definitely uh, uh, you know uh, hopefully after getting uh, you know a well a well series of funding uh, uh, we are actually hoping uh, something around uh, you know initially uh, the salary could be like somewhere around uh, eight or so like per annum okay so that's what i'm expecting so i hope uh, you know no, my co-founders are not hearing <laughs> anyway yeah thank you so much Any other questions? I okay. I guess we should proceed. There are no, there are no questions, sir. I have almost cleared every doubt of everyone. Okay. okay. So, thank you.
thank, thank you, you sir thank you ma'am we are overwhelmed to have you and thank you for pushing our wall of knowledge to a greater world uh, an event is never complete without a perfect vote of thanks hereby i call upon anup for summing up the webinar hello am i audible yes you are, you are. yes you are yes you are thank you it's an honor to me anup banerjee to have been asked to offer a vote of thanks on the occasion of the webinar statistics the core of machine learning i did like to express deep gratitude to our principal respected dr prashant shilke sir for his support and for allowing us to conduct this wonderful webinar which will surely encourage us in our future events on behalf of my college and entire management group here i pay very heartly gratitude to mr mayur mahorkar data scientist at and symbol ai nagpur and ms madhumita roy data analyst harmonize california usa for presenting their immense knowledge with us in today's webinar this will surely help us to decide our future courses after graduation i must remark a sense of gratefulness for sharing with us some of the finest information and inspiring all of us by your highly sparkling words for the moon i would like to thank dr rishi agarwal sir hod of maths department and dr Th thomas philip sir hod of physics department for lending a hand of support towards this program by encouraging their students to attend it we have, we have been fortunate to have our teachers Dr. Jyoti Shivalkam, ma'am, and Dr. Mamta Bhaiti, ma'am, for sharing their graceful words, leading supervision, and inspiring all at every point of time in college. I would also like to thank the Department of Statistics and the Department of Computer Science of Islamabad College for organizing the enlightening program for us. A special thanks to Ensemble AI Startup for taking initiative to organize such a joint venture. to orient us in machine learning i'm thankful to all the participants to join us for attending the webinar and giving their precious time i want to extend my generous thanks to the entire team who organized the whole webinar and made us through without any glitch i would also love to thank all the attendees for their involvement and the willingness they expressed during the webinar so i thank our honorable speakers and professors for taking the initiative of hosting this webinar for us it's grateful to thank the members of the webinar about their valuable information thank you and have a nice day thank you guys thanks everyone thank you ma'am thank you sir madhumita and mayur really very wonderfully you very wonderfully you explain the need for machine learning and your presentations were wonderful too. thanks from my thank department you. and from the science department okay yeah. thank you very much ma'am it was my pleasure thank you for